First of all, we're really pleased to join with our friends and comrades in the Morning Star at this meeting. And you know, the role of the Morning Star is becoming ever more vital in opposing the new Cold War and, and in defending and supporting China. Now, the Communist Party of China is, I believe, the world's most important political party. We've heard the membership figures. I just say that uh, that membership is greater than all the other communist and workers' parties in the world and all other political parties professing a commitment to socialism combined. The Communist Party of China, as we've heard, is a Marxist political party. It leads the world's most populous country and the world's second largest economy. China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and today, be it international financial crisis, global pandemic, the looming threat of climate change, or regional hotspots, no major issue facing humanity can be successfully tackled without China's active and constructive input. The centenary of the CPC is therefore, or at least ought to be, an occasion for celebration, not only for the Chinese people, but also for all socialists, anti-imperialists, and progressive people throughout the world. The CPC has, from its inception, been an internationalist party. It represented the striving of Chinese patriots to find a viable way to save the people and rejuvenate the nation. But it also arose directly from the October Socialist Revolution in neighboring Russia. As Chairman Mao memorably put it, the salvos of the October Revolution brought us Marxism-Leninism. Before the October Revolution, the Chinese people did not even know the names of Marx and Engels, let alone that of Lenin. Now, there is, of course, room for discussion on the later part played by the Comintern in certain phases of the Chinese Revolution. But the founding of the CPC is surely inseparable from its support and assistance. And the CPC's early and rapid growth and development, in particular during the, first, the period of the first united front between the CPC and the Guomindang, from 1924 to 1927, also owed an enormous amount to the Comintern's all-round assistance and advice. In turn, the Chinese Revolution was also intimately connected with the revolution in neighboring countries in particular. Jenny's just mentioned how it was the Chinese people's resistance above all that ensured that throughout the period of the anti-fascist world war, the Soviet Union never had to fight on two fronts at the same time. And the leaders of the Vietnamese and Korean revolutions, Ho Chi Minh and Kim Il-sung, both spent an important part of their revolutionary careers in China and in keeping with the general practice of the international communist movement at that time, both became CPC members during that period of their life. The founding of the People's Republic of China on October the 1st, 1949, of course, played a major role in shifting the balance of forces in the world in favor of socialism, people's democracy, national independence, and peace. But just one year later, China was at war again. US imperialism's vicious war in Korea posed a direct threat to China, and not only of a land invasion. The increasingly unhinged US General MacArthur actually proposed the dropping of atomic weapons on all the major cities of both China and the Soviet Union. It was no easy thing for the fledgling People's Republic, faced with overwhelming problems of poverty and backwardness, and devastated by decades of turmoil, invasion and war, to decide to confront US imperialism head on. The mobilization of the vast Chinese People's Volunteer Army, as a result of Chairman Mao's bold strategic decision, and commanded by Marshal Peng De Hui in the, in the war to resist aggression and aid Korea, to safeguard peace and defend our homes, not only turned the tide on the Korean Peninsula, it arguably prevented a land invasion of China and certainly made a massive contribution to ensuring that a pro-US regime was not installed on China's northeastern border, about 1,000 kilometers from Beijing and facing into its then in industrial heartland. But the cost and scale of sacrifice was enormous, above all in hundreds of thousands of casualties, including Chairman Mao's own son, Mao and Ying, who lies buried in Korean soil. Besides, the US sent its seventh fleet into the Taiwan Straits, preventing the complete liberation and reunification of China, and imposed a crippling economic embargo that was to last until 1972. In my view, part of the special character of the Chinese Revolution lies in that it is both a socialist revolution led by a Marxist-Leninist party 
and simultaneously an anti-imperialist revolution in a semi-colonial country of a people of color who constitute the overwhelming global majority. I think this still carries tremendous significance in a world that to a considerable extent remains characterized by Lenin's definition of one divided into a small number of oppressed nations on the one hand and a great mass of oppressed nations on the other. Hence, the concept of a united front against imperialism in one form or another has always been intrinsic to the foreign policy of the People's Republic. Jenny's mentioned the um, Bandung Conference of Afro-Asian countries in 1955, where Joe Enlai played a, a leading role. And she's also mentioned his initiation with the leaders of India and Burma of the five principles of peaceful coexistence, which with their stress on mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, non-aggression and non-interference in internal affairs and equality and mutual benefit represent the antithesis of the imperialist approach to international relations. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s in particular, China actively and militantly supported anti-imperialist struggles in the world. Most significant was the massive support it extended to the peoples of Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia in their, brutal, in their struggles against the brutal US war of aggression. More than 300,000 Chinese troops were committed to Vietnam where they enabled more Vietnamese fighters to join the front line in the South by defending and rehabilitating the railways and manning the anti-aircraft defenses in major cities like Hanoi and Haiphong in the North. And, the, and, and China also extended considerable support to national liberation movements in countries like Algeria, Palestine, Guinea-Bissau, Oman, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and numerous other countries. For example, in his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela recalls how he sent Walter Sisulu to China as far back as 1954 to secure support for the anti-apartheid struggle. China also began its foreign aid programs when it was still itself a very poor country. China's medical assistance to Africa, which continues to this day, began with the dispatch of 100 healthcare workers to Algeria in 1963, very shortly after that country gained its independence from France. Between 1970 to 1975, China built the Tazara Railway together with Zambia and Tanzania to enable Zambia to freely export its copper, breaking its economic dependence on then white ruled Rhodesia and South Africa. The construction and cost in today's value uh, was in excess of 2.7 billion US dollars. And significantly, recipients of Chinese aid including, included countries which then had much higher standards of living than China itself. For example, in 1975, China built the popularly known Red China Dock in Malta, the largest dry dock in the Mediterranean, after the progressive government of Don Mintoff expelled the British military base and embraced non-alignment. Now, after Mao's death in 1976, as we've heard, the leadership around Deng Xiaoping placed overwhelming emphasis on domestic economic development. In personal discussions with Chinese comrades over those ensuing years, I was repeatedly told that a stronger and more prosperous China would be able to make a much greater contribution to people throughout the world in the future. And today, I think we can see more clearly what this means. Uh, Consistently displaying a strategy of multilateralism and multipolarity, China is steadily laying down the building blocks of a genuinely new international political and economic order through such means as the BRICS grouping, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, and similar mechanisms with, for example, the countries of East and Southeast Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Central and Eastern Europe the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and above all, the Belt and Road Initiative. Whilst China does not interfere in others' affairs or seek to export revolution, as Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez both recognized, China is today the most, indis most indispensable external factor for countries seeking to defend their independence and build socialism. And as comrade Xi Jinping put it at the 19th Party Congress in October 2017, the path, the theory, the system, and the culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics have kept developing, blazing a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization. It offers a new option for other countries and nations 
who want to speed up their development while preserving their independence. One does not have to agree with China on everything to appreciate, especially having experienced the loss of the Soviet Union, that the loss of the People's Republic of China would be an unmitigated disaster, not only for the Chinese people, but for any people who today seek to defend their independence and build a new society. And to say that the CPC has always been an internationalist party does not mean that one has to consider that all of China's policies and actions have always been correct. Life is certainly a lot more complicated than that. We could discuss who bears the primary responsibility for the Sino-Soviet split. But what seems beyond dispute to me is that it was, along with the collapse of the USSR and the, Euro and the European Socialist Bloc, to which it is intimately related, the greatest tragedy and misfortune to befall the international communist and workers movement, whose negative consequences we are still experiencing. That is why, and especially in the context of the new Cold War, it is so important to support and defend the People's Republic of China today. In November 1989, faced with the events in Eastern Europe, Deng Xiaoping observed to Tanzanian President Julius Nereri, so long as socialism does not collapse in China, it will always hold its ground in the world. In today's world, I think we can see even more clearly the correctness and farsightedness of that statement. And it is in this spirit that we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. Thank you all very much.